Good morning or afternoon. Welcome to FISMA Fridays. Delighted to have such a large crowd joining us. Uh, my name is Jill Bender with Safety Chain Software and look forward to an interesting topic today um, on the FDA FISMA guidance is out. What is it telling us? Uh, it be interesting, especially given that we are past our first compliance date. Uh, we've been talking about and hosting these sessions for literally years now, um, so it's some exciting um, information sure to come in the, in the coming months. Just as a friendly reminder, um, we will be sending out the recording link. If you are online and have questions, go ahead and submit them in the Q&A tab. If you're having trouble hearing, go ahead and use the call-in number. And as always, we will start with what's new on the FISMA front and then dive into some of the pre-submitted questions. I am delighted to have um, Dr. David Atchison on the call with us today. Good morning, David. Good morning, Jill. And I um, thank you. I'm delighted uh, David was flying in from a whirlwind of globe prodding in different countries and uh, currently I believe here in, here in uh, what, St. Louis Airport joining us today. So thanks uh, for uh, still making this happen. Of course, yeah, no, and I apologize up front for airport noise, but I'm sure everybody on the call understands that one. <laughs> Absolutely. And so I'd say let's go ahead and get started. And again, I see lots of people coming in already. Um, it's going to be a popular session today. So, David, as always, let's get started. What's the latest um, the past month that's happened on the FISMA front? Yeah, no, thanks, Jill. And, and you know, and again, thanks for uh, everybody who's dialed into FISMA Fridays. Um, well, a couple of things. I think the first thing I'll just mention is obviously we are past D-Day deadline. Um, Mid-September has, has come and gone, and we're now almost in October. Um, so, you know, I, it's like uh, kind of came in with a whimper a little bit. Um, I've heard not a word from anybody to say, oh, FDA showed up my facility and, and beat the heck out of me because my food safety plan wasn't good enough. So, um, frankly, if there's anybody on the call who's had a visit and had their food safety plan looked at, we'd love to hear from you. Let's uh, Let's share experiences. I think that's part of where FISMA Friday can go in the next, uh, in, the, in the coming months as we move forward. Is uh, let's learn and share what um, what's going on. So that's that's on that point. The other, the only other update I want to give is that um, just in the last few days, FDA has popped out another guidance document, a um, little bit one below the radar screen to some extent, but it's um, it's to do with the food facility registration. And I think this is just an important one to touch on, um, mainly because, just a reminder for everybody, food facility registration is is due October, December time frame. We're in our two-year cycle, 2016. Um, so we're, we're, we're back up to just uh, renewing those registrations, checking that they're right. And I think many people in, uh, in the past have just sort of said, yeah, we're good. Um, so I just want to alert you all to the fact that this one, is, has changed the categories uh, for food facility registrations. Um, this guidance document, which is, if you remember, was a piece of the original Food Safety Modernization Act statute. There was a requirement for FDA to update registration requirements, um, part of which was the uh, every two years re-registration. But this guidance document has come out with new categories of food. and. Uh, what's, what's striking about this guidance document is that the FDA actually say in the guidance document, and it's pretty short, it's only about seven or eight pages, um, but they say in there that normally guidance is not binding, which is true, but it makes it very clear that this guidance is binding. It does lay out the categories w to which we are all supposed to look at and determine whether the categories of food that we're producing, um, and it pertains to manufacturers, processors, packers, and holders, basically those who have to register, obviously, um, to, to be compliant. So this is a regulatory requirement, and thus if you don't have your food categories right, um, you would be out of compliance with, uh, with regulatory requirements and could get dinged on it. So a little bit of extra detail on that one, Jill, but it was sort of hot off the press, and I thought let's just get everybody up to speed on that because uh, the renewal dates for registration are just around the corner. So, so check that one out. It's called Necessity of the Use of Food Product Categories in Food Facility Registration and Updates to Food Product Categories 2016 Edition Guidance for Industry. But it's not actually guidance, 
it's a requirement. So anyway, long-winded Jill, but uh, back to you. Um, certainly an, an important distinction here as far as um, being a requirement versus just a guidance document, very interesting. In your estimation, and again, it's, it just came out, um, but it sounds like it might be the shorter of the documents um, with, the, with the, uh, the guidances that have come out, but based on the quick glance, do you, do you think that there's a lot of distinct changes? Is it pretty straightforward? No, it's, it, it's pretty straightforward, Jill. I mean, it's not complex. Um, I think it's just making sure that what you've got in your registration document with what you're doing just fits with the FDA categories. They've moved a few things around, so I don't think it's going to be a lot of changes. It's not going to be a lot of work. It's really just, you know, if somebody wants, to, an inspector wants to get all technical on you um, and, and, and is having a bad day, then if, you, if your categories aren't right, I could see they could, they could write you off on it. Um, but it really isn't a very heavy lift, so it shouldn't be too difficult to change. Okay, great. And you got a little smile to me saying a, a bad day. That would never happen with inspectors, right? Oh, um, no, 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 no. So let's get going then. And that, that was absolutely a perfect start. And I think, as you're saying, the guidance documents are definitely um, long. So I'm glad to hear that this, this particular guidance slash regulatory requirement document um, was short in nature. But um, again, we're going to focus um, this month's discussion on the guidance documents. And just a note to those um, folks, you know, as we do with FISMA Fridays, we, we try to make it as topical and relevant um, based on what is going on with FISMA. So today's session did get changed from something we had planned earlier, um, environmental control monitoring, which we will focus on in later months. So delighted that we're able to move this topic to something that's um, specific to what's happening. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and throw the first question at you, David. Uh, what is the reason behind uh, publishing these guidance documents from the FDA, FDA, and what should the food industry do with these documents? Yeah, <laughs> you know, it's interesting. I mean, that, 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 that question, Jill, sort of pertains to well, what is guidance all about, and I've just completely shot that in the foot with what I just said, because guidance <laughs> is not meant to be binding. Um, it is meant to be guidance. Um, so, um, and typically, guidance from FDA is exactly that. Um, well, what these are about is, is really allowing us to see kind of a little bit is what's inside FDA's head. And as I'm sure everybody on the call has realized, this is not all the guidance documents pertaining to FISMA. We're gonna, there's going to be a whole bunch more. But it's, but it's a good start. And, and, it's, and, and what it's done is it's added, I think, clarification in some pretty important areas where I think there was a lot of opacity. For example, um, one of the guidance documents to me is, is really saying, am I a manufacturer slash processor or am I a farm? And we all got in a real tangle over the issues of with certain Oh, certain activities in certain places that are not clearly like on a farm, they're geographically removed from a farm, but are they secondary activities farms? So there's a very, there's a very nice guidance document with, with a lot of, I think, good examples in there, of different scenarios that, that help, help the reader determine, well, am I classified as a farm and under the produce rule, or am I classified as a manufacturer processor and under the uh, preventive control rules? Um, so there's a lot of helpful info on that. There's also um, in, in the longest guidance document, which is really around the first few chapters of building your food safety plan, I think there's a, I think there's a lot of useful information in that around what FDA is thinking um, and, and how one should approach assessing your hazards and, and implementing preventive controls. Um, so I think there's, uh, that, I mean, really that's the purpose of it, is, is to allow you to see what it is they're thinking um, and, and use it as a guide um, to help us figure out how to be compliant. Okay, great. And again, this, these are just guides versus the guide requirements that you <laughs> chatted about earlier. Yes, yes, these, these, are, these are not mandated, <laughs> absolutely, yes. Okay, great. Well, let's move on and um, talk about the main gui guidance documents that have been pu published. Right, yeah, and I've obviously just, just mentioned a couple, and, and I know my, uh, my colleague, Peyman, um, talked last time about uh, the one that shifted on a few, um, 
a few deadlines, um, on compliance dates, I should say. So we've got the one that moves a few compliance dates around. Uh, we've got the one that I was just talking about, which which is about the uh, harvesting, packing, holding, and the manufacturing, processing, and versus uh, versus farms guidance. So we've got that one. We've got some guidance on the uh, on, on on human food byproducts for use as animal food. Um, that's a pretty short one, but I think it's 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 helpful in terms of uh, those who are manufacturing uh, human food. Um, that have some byproducts that are heading off into to animals. Um, and then we have the, what I would call the monster, which is the, um, the, the, the about hazard analysis and risk-based preventive controls. That one's about 234 pages long. Um, and that's, that's the one that's got a lot of detail in it around um, the, um, as I said, about how one defines a, uh, a hazard, how the FDA is expecting us to think about hazards, and also comes with a with a pretty substantive set of appendices too, which add yet more weight to it. Okay, great. And I think if I recall from our last session, that links to these guides, um, these guidance documents, you all have posted those on your your website, right? So for yeah, for yes. the, uh, Okay, now yeah. so we'll, we'll, we'll yeah. put that out in email as a follow-up too, just a reminder, um, the Actions and Groups website does have a link mm -hmm. to all these documents that are, we're, we're deferring to. Great. Um, so what about the appendices? What are those all about? Well, the, the, and I'll, I'll, I'll admit, I have not read the appendices from one <laughs> end to the other. Um, but, but, the, but the appendices um, are starting to provide us with, um, I, I think, some some interesting focus on exactly what hazards the FDA is thinking about in different types of foods. So when we, when we sort of say, all right, um, we're supposed to think of potential hazards, and w within that we're supposed to determine which of those hazards in our system rise to the level that requires a preventive control. Um, what, what this appendix has done is at least in my view, has thrown out what FDA thinks are the, the, the microbial risks, the physical risks, and the chemical risks that we should be thinking about. Um, so it's, it's, it's another 200 plus pages of material um, and is, in, in, in my view, has got a lot of useful information in it. My, well, my concern about it is how much of this is set in stone? Um, you know, how much of this will actually be considered a, uh, a sort of, um, well, we haven't said you've got to do it, but if you don't consider all these things, we would, we would regard you as being out of compliance and, and, and defaulting. And, and that's where I think some people are struggling. In fact, somebody um, asked me a question not very long ago about, certain microbes that were present in a food commodity that they work on. And it's like, well, why are those in there? Um, what's the rationale behind that? We've never worried about them. They've never been linked to illness. And, it, you know, it's, it, and it's hard to know quite how, how to answer that question other than to say, well, if you've looked at your commodities, and I certainly recommend everybody do that, um, look at this appendix. And, and look at the commodities that you happen to manage as you're looking at your food safety plan and seeing what it is that FDA's kind of identified. You, might have, you may have identified some things they haven't thought of, um, but if you haven't specifically addressed the things that they have thought of, I'd suggest you do that. doesn't mean they automatically have to elevate to preventive control. But if you've decided that they, that they don't need to do that, elevate to a preventive control, my read is that this appendix is at least saying that the FDA considers them a potential hazard in that type of food. So my recommendation would be in your food safety plan would be to put them in as a potential hazard. And then in that little section where the recommendation is you defend your decision, you, you articulate why you've, particularly if you decided it's, it's not a hazard, is like what's your rationale behind that thought process? And um, so if, if everybody's tracking with me, then let me go over it again. 
look at the appendix and and, and look at look through it in terms of the commodities that, that you are involved with in your food safety plan. See whether there are microbiological, physical, or chemical risks that the agencies identified that you haven't you haven't addressed. If there are, pop them in your food safety plan, and you may say, as just to repeat, you may you may say you may look at them and say, well, these aren't a risk, but put a little statement in there as to why you don't think it's a risk. And my reasoning for that suggestion is, I think the FDA inspectors might show up at your plan with a copy of this appendix, or at least having looked at the section. They're saying, well, I'm off to visit a flour mill or, or some manufacturing facility. So let me, let me have a look at the appendix and see what, what hazards we as the agency thought should be addressed. And they'll go in there armed with that, and they may look at your food safety plan, and they'll say, well, you didn't address this hazard. Why not? And the answer probably shouldn't be, oh, we never thought of it. I think the answer should be, yeah, we thought of that, and let me refer to my food safety plan. Oh, here we go. Here was, here was the decision process. This is why we didn't think it was a hazard. Um, it's all nicely documented in our food safety plan. So lots and lots and lots of insight as to what the FDA is thinking of, of risks, which is great. I think that's really good to know. A um, little bit of a double-edged sword because there's things in there that folk may say, well, it doesn't make sense to me. But as I've just suggested, Jill, I think there's a strategy to manage that. Um, and again, as we evolve through FISMA and people have got FISMA war stories to, uh, to share with us, then I think that... Um, that, 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 that could be useful learning for everybody who, uh, who chimes into and dials into FISMA Fridays. So back to you on, the, on that one. Oh, no, absolutely. Thank you. I think uh, it sounds like a, a bit of a um, making sure your bases are covered. And I always, you know, every time we do these calls, David, you're always so great about sharing of making sure you have your narrative and your story um, and then the, the details to back that up. So it sounds just like, like that theme again, correct? Yeah, no, exactly. Right. And, it, and the devil is always in the details. And, I, you know, I, and, and I would just sort of reiterate um, that um, kind of the word on the street is that FDA inspectors over time will be arriving at your facility, I think, more prepared than traditionally they have been, which means they will have done a little homework, that they will have looked at what, what is this plant doing, making, packing, holding, um, uh, that 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 I need to pay attention to, that I, the inspector needs to pay attention to. So they're going. I think they're going. They will go in there having done a bit more homework, and I'm just suspicious that part of that homework may well be looking at these appendices and kind of going in there with 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 that armed. Um, and and if you've got that all just sitting there and they look through that, they to me that's just going to create a really good positive impression that you're on the game. You've looked at what the FDA has offered at their guidance documents, and I think that will just set you on the on the right track with the FDA. It won't get you out of trouble if you've got some bad stuff going on, but but, but at least you're not starting in a hole. Got it. Well, it sounds like they're, they're, they're using the guidance documents as much as uh, the audience here, right? Uh, yes, I think, I think so. I think so, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, so I think that the next question we had was in reference to Appendix 1, but I'm not sure if that – was that the one you were just really um, diving into, or is that something different? It, 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 it was, Jill. Yeah, I kind of just sort of morphed right into the, what the appendices are all about, into into the details of Appendix 1. But but sort of let me sort of round out the rest of that question, because I did sort of get completely um, <laughs> dug into Appendix 1. Um, the other the other appendices are really, I think, just helpful tools. There's, there's forms in there. There's other useful things in there. Um, appendix 2, 3, they're, they're, they're a good deal shorter. Um, but I think that they are, um, you know, there's, 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 there's some useful information in there. For example, in Appendix 2, um, it, it calls itself food safety plan forms. Um, so if you're looking for templates to use, uh, have a look in, in Appendix 2, because there's a whole bunch of them. Um, you know, again, guidance. And the FDA have made it pretty clear, at least by my read, is that we're not required to use the forms they they recommend. Well, recommend is too strong a term. We're not required to use the forms that they put on their on their website. Um, you can do it any which way you want. They just, I think, they're doing this to be helpful. 
it also gives us a sense of what points need to be addressed in your food safety plan. So obviously, if you're using the FDA forms, they are going to be familiar to the FDA inspectors. Um, you are de facto going to address all of the points in the different columns and the different questions if you're using their forms. Um, and it'll be familiar, as I said, to the FDA inspectors. So I think there's a lot of advantage to using their forms or something that's very similar to it. Um, but it's not a mandate. You, you, can, you can do it any way you, you wish. Um, Appendix 3 is um, pretty technical. And I will confess, I have not read Appendix 3 in any kind of detail. Um, but, it, but it's about um, helping companies understand about bacterial uh, pathogen growth and inactivations and um, D values and Z values and, and some hardcore food microbiology points, which I think uh, really are very technical, but um, but could be helpful for a company that's that's kind of maybe struggling a little bit with some of those questions in terms of of whether their um, kill steps that they're proposing or their preventive control steps are adequate. So uh, those are really the, 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 three, uh, the three appendices that, uh, the, that I'm aware of. They talked about Appendix 4. Um, and, you know, to be honest with, with everybody, I haven't found Appendix 4 yet. I was, I've been hunting for it, and it may be one of the ones that's just not out yet. Um, I did see Appendix 1, 2, and 3. So if anybody on the line has found Appendix 4 and can illuminate me as to what that's about, that would be good. So um, anyway, Jill, that's, that's a bit more about the appendices. No, great. And and I'll offer this. If someone uh, shows up with Appendix 4, we'll, we'll treat you to a, a Starbucks or something. How's that sound? Um, <laughs> Very good. <laughs> um, let's move on then. Uh, how should a regulated food company use the uh, guidance documents? Yeah. Um, well, I've sort of been touching on that throughout the, right. the course of the conversation so far. I think, um, you know, my, my first point is, they, these are long and very, very detailed. So, I, I, it's for anybody to have read them from one end to the other is, is you know, that's a significant list. And we're not done yet. We've just basically got the first few chapters out on the, um, on the preventive control rules ones, and, and there's going to be a whole lot more coming. So, um, you know, I think, I think my suggestion is, first of all, look, just Glance through them from one end to the other. Look at look at the headers. If you if you don't have time to literally read this from one end to the other, and even if you did, you probably wouldn't remember everything that was in it. But look at the headers and and see if there are things in that that jump out at you as like, here's here's a process that we're using. Here's a preventive control that we're focused on, or or here's a situation that pertains especially to me. Take a read of that section and just sort of see whether your thinking is aligned with FDA's thinking. Um, again, if it's not, that, that's not by any means suggesting you're out of compliance. There's more than one way to get from A to B. So, um, so, so use, use them as, as, as a reference is, uh, in the first instance. Then I think over time, as we get into these more and we can talk about different interesting sections within, with, with, within the guidance documents, um, they'll, become, they'll become more and more helpful. I think the other way to use them, as I've suggested, but just to reiterate, is as you're building your food safety plan, and you're, if you're not using the FDA forms, just have a look at Appendix 2 and make sure that you've at least got all the bases covered in terms of what the expectations are there. Um, I think that's just a quick, helpful check. Um, and use that Appendix 1 to, to, to figure out whether there's any hazards that the FDA is thinking about that you haven't thought about. Um, so at a high level, Jill, I think that's, that's the way I would recommend that the companies use them. Um, simply, with the exception of those companies that have got big resources, most folk don't have the time to really read these from, from end to end um, in the time frame that we have, bearing in mind that they came out, what, like a month before compliance date for big companies. Um, so I think the, the guidance document conversations are going to continue for quite a while because, to me, uh, this is a lot about where the rubber hits the road on these regs. Uh, well, it sounds like long time coming, important, important information that, that's finally out from the FDA. So, so I guess, yes, it's very much. Yeah. Yeah. So kind of rounding this off, and you've been talking about this as part of our discussion, um, but again, sort of, you know, what will the FDA say if you don't follow the guidance document suggestions? 
Yeah, well, with, with the exception of that, my very first <laughs> FISMA update comment, um, which um, obviously is a little different. Um, the FDA have always maintained the guidance documents are non-binding. My view of those, of that statement, uh, and I'm looking at this from the lens of somebody who worked at FDA for a number of years and then uh, obviously more recently been on the, on the, in the private sector. Um, the, the, in a literal sense, the agency is telling you how they see it, is these guidance documents are not binding. However, my view is that if you are not following what the guidance documents recommend, you better have an explanation. You're not going to get a 483 because you're out of compliance, quote, with guidance because you don't need to be compliant in the first place. But I think it's a very wise company and, and quality assurance or food safety professional who looks at what they're doing and the controls they have in place and makes sure that what they're doing comports with the guidance, is on track with the, with the guidance, is at least equivalent to the guidance. Um, because if you're, if you're not and you are below that level, then I think – I think there is there is there's risk. It's not risk of getting a 483, but it's 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 risk that when the inspector looks at what you're up to and realizes that you're really not doing what the food safety experts in the agency are recommending, that's that's to me is a bit of a red flag to go pull on loose threads. Um, I think the other factor here, just to sort of take it outside of the FISMA thinking, is that the cost of doing business, the price of doing business is regulatory compliant. You have to do that just simply to operate. It really is, um, you know, on, our, on our risk maturity model that we use at TAG, it really is a sort of, uh, it's what good is about. If you're looking at good, better, best in class, good is just being compliant. Um, I, think there's, I think there's information in these guidance documents that can, can actually get you thinking outside the box. It can take you in different directions, and it can start to, to elevate your game, um, which then fundamentally starts to reduce risk for you, for your company, for your customers, for consumers, and that has a brand protection impact. So kind of look at these a little bit, not just purely through the – regulatory lens, but like, is there information in here that could actually be helpful to me from a brand protection perspective? Um, although recognizing, obviously, what, this, the, what our conversations on FISMA Friday is all about is, is regulatory compliance. So that's, um, that's how I, I see them um, kind of being used and how the FDA will be, will be looking, looking at these is uh, pay attention to them, but you don't need to follow them word for word. Okay, great, thank you. And it sounds you're, you're alluding to also the sort of the silver lining, if you will, in the cloud, right, of, of a FISMA, which we've, we've always talked about in general. So elevated yeah. game. Yes, yes, yeah. yes, exactly, right. No, that, that's good. Um, so I would say, you know, really the, I think the last question we sort of had, um, you know, to sort of what can we expect in the future, right? So it sounds like um, – all, all, all the guidance documents are we should um, are out at this point, and are we expecting any more? What what else is on in the near future here? Oh, I think we're expecting a whole bunch more. Um, yeah, I mean the FDA has made it very clear that this is just the first few chapters of of the of the guidance documents. Um, I'm anticipating a ton of guidance documents coming out. Because really, these ones that we've got are focused on the preventive control rule. Um, we, we've not got guidance documents to any, um, any degree on any, any of the other rules, which we've talked about on previous Trisma Fridays. So I'm anticipating a bunch more guidance will, will emerge over the months and years ahead. Um, we've also got a couple more rules to come out, too. And obviously, we've got uh, some potential rules on product tracking, for example, that will come out. I, don't, I have no idea when, but, but, um, but there is that requirement around uh, enhanced product tracking for high-risk foods. Which, um, which has sort of been sitting in the wings for a long, long time. So I think, uh, yeah, we're not done yet, Jill, with, with, uh, with guidance documents or even final rules. 
So, so again, more Folger for conversation during our FISMA Fridays. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, FISMA, FISMA Fridays will go on for another month or two, I have no doubt. Excellent. Well, as far as for FISMA Fridays today, um, we are at the bottom of the hour, though. We've we've had a few questions come in. I know, Dave, you're in between flights. Do you have um, about five, ten more minutes to stay on with us? Yeah, most certainly. I do, yes, of course. Okay. No, I appreciate that. And, I've, and just to let everyone know, I've taken us out of full screen. I've seen some questions already coming in. Um, if you could go ahead and put in more questions. Um, I also will take this opportunity to do my monthly plug as part as the host of FISMA Fridays. Uh, absolutely, as you know, um, TAG, the Atchison Group, is an, a tremendous resource to the industry in helping you uh, understand FISMA and impact and, and with your company. Um, so I encourage you to uh, visit their site and more importantly call if you need help with their guidance. And, of course, I would be remiss not to plug Safety Chain. You know, it's interesting, David, when you were saying thinking outside the box or elevating the game, we, all, we often hear that, of reasons why people move from paper-based paper manual forms and processes to a more uh, comprehensive system like Safety Chain that helps with supplier compliance and certain program tasks and controls are, are being uh, achieved and properly documented and so forth. So um, thank you for that. Let me go ahead and um, dive into some of the questions here. Um, first, a call out. It looks like we did get an answer to Appendix 4 um, from Nora. Thank you. It says that it's listed as coming soon and it will be on sanitation and hy hygienic um, zoning um, is, is what she's mentioned. So. Oh, right. No, uh, no, excellent. Well, well, thank you, Nora. Um, and I'm, you know, the I, I did see what it was on. I just couldn't find it. And the reason I couldn't find it because it's not there yet. So thank you for, for <laughs> confirming confirming that one. It makes me feel less stupid. Less, uh, well, I'd say you're less crazy, right? <laughs> so thank you, yeah, Nora. Right, and, right. Um, True, true to my word, I'll ask our my uh, marketing manager to send you out a gift card for some coffee, so thank you for that. Um, I have a couple questions. Uh, one's a little bit different from what we've been talking about, but I'll go ahead and throw it at you, um, David, if you don't mind. Um, one specific to, it sounds like this might be a dairy products company, um, so let me go ahead and read the question. With the new FISMA requirements for transportation food products for human consumption, do you, we have to monitor the temperature inside the trailer for the entire duration of the delivery for all the dairy products? And then he, he talks about how deliveries with multiple stops might, you know, uh, drive the temperature up with, you know, the door opening and closing. Um, any thoughts on that one? Yeah, no, that's, that's a good question. And, and let me sort of take it uh, and try to answer that, Jill, in a, in a more general sense, um, just, just not dairy specific, because I think the question pertains to anything. Um, you know, I think the answer to this is keep in mind what the purpose of the sanitary transport rule is about. Um, and oh, excuse me, somebody's just going by me with a very noisy trolley. Uh -huh. All right, sorry about sorry about that. Um, but but the, the the intent of that rule is to make sure that food that is being moved in a road manner or a rail manner, um, the risks for food safety are controlled. So I think the, the the detailed answer for for the person asking that question is is you you probably would need to ensure that however many stops you make and how, however often you open the door is that the food inside does not get exposed to a temperature that that could create a food safety hazard. Now the FDA has not been prescriptive as to how you do that. It hasn't said you need continuous monitoring. It hasn't said you've got to have um, technology and trucks that will allow you to do that. To me, that's a great way to do it because then you know. Um, but the uh, the intent is look at your process as a carrier and determine if during that temperatures are going to rise to a level where it would create a hazard. If they are, you'd need to control them. Um, there's, there's nothing in the rule that I would say that will require you to have continuous monitoring, which is kind of a very specific um, technological solution. If you do, it kind of takes care of it, and you'd be alerted as would your recipient of the product if, it, if something had gone out of uh, out of acceptable temperature range. So keep in mind the the um, I, I think the purpose of the rule, which is to control food safety risks during transportation, particularly with regard to uh, refrigerated foods. 
Great. Okay. Thank you. And of course, um, elevating the game or thinking differently, um, utilizing technology is available. I, you know, we we have customers certainly that um, are able to manage their their temperatures and be alerted when things are reading reaching too high. Of, you know, their CCPs. So, um, thank you for that answer. Let me dive into a few more here. Um, what do we have? Omar is asking, does the guidance address preventive controls for companies that do not inherently have a kill step in their process? That's an, an interesting one. Might be well, a little yeah. <laughs> right. No, no, I think they do. Um, but this gets to the fundamentals of the food safety plan. And if you read the, the sort of the, the chapters that are there on this, and it's talking about preventive controls and it's talking about um, how one approaches them philosophically and what they mean. And there's some very interesting, for those of you who haven't read it, there's, there's some very interesting comparisons between HACCP and a food safety plan. And we've been saying ever since I think Fismer Fridays began is that food safety plan is not HACCP. And um, the, the guidance documents get into that in a lot of detail and point out why it's not and in what way it's different. And they point out that you may not have a, a preventive control step. You may not have a kill step, but you still need a food safety plan because you need to have looked at the risks. And it may be that the controls for those risks are, are, are ones that are being instigated by your suppliers or by your customers, not by you. Um, so it's it's totally reasonable that you don't have a kill step. That's, that's fine. Um, but but you still need to go through the process of identifying potential hazards, which of those require preventive control um, around the criteria included in the guidance documents. Um, pop that all in your, your in your food safety plan, and just because you don't have a, a conventional kill step doesn't, doesn't matter at all. Okay, thank you. No, I appreciate that. Let me move on to a couple other quick questions here while we still have you for another minute or two. Um, one's in regards to the FSVP rule, the Forward Supplier Verification Program, um, in relation to uh, regulations, is how to prepare. That's a little bit of a loaded question, right? Because um, it doesn't tell my guidance documents are out yet, but what would be sort of a, a high level of advice on, on that question on preparing for FSVP? Yeah, no, I, it's, you know, it's a very, it's a, it's a question I get pretty often. It's how do we, how do we tackle this beast? And, and you're right, it's not, it's not related to the guidance per se, but that's, um, that's fine. Um, you, you know, I think the, the, the point about foreign supply verification program is question one, ask yourself whether it pertains to you. Um, are you an importer as defined by FDA? And have you, uh, or, and if you are, then FSVP may apply. You may still be importing foods, but you basically control those risks through subpart G of the preventive control rule, which is the supply chain risk control part of your food safety plan. Assuming that you are an importer and that you are not under subpart G of supply chain control, then um, in, in essence, the, 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 what you need to do is to create a list of everything that you're importing. And looking down that list, oh, the truck's coming back. Oh, goodness. Sorry about that, everybody. Um, it, it, it's, 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 a, it's a tile floor with a truck with hard wheels. And anyway, apologize for the noise. Too much detail. Um, so so, so create, create a list of all of the things that you're importing. And then one by one, look at those and determine hazards. And, and, and determine um, then whether the, the, who's controlling those hazards. Is it somebody you're shipping it to? or is it somebody who's upstream who you're purchasing it from? It's perfectly okay for somebody downstream who you're shipping it to to be controlling the hazards. If, if the upstream person is controlling the hazards, i.e. Your, your supplier, um, then you need to determine an appropriate verification activity that those indeed risks are being controlled. That verification activity may be certificates of analysis, it may be a review of their food safety programs, um, it may be a, a required on-site audit, which if it's a risk that reaches the level of a, of a potential serious adverse health consequence, class one recall situation, then that requires an annual on-site audit. So um, just to recap, if you're an importer, look at everything that you're bringing in, do a hazard analysis, determine who is controlling the risk, 
verify that that risk is being controlled if, if it's coming from your supplier through one of those mechanisms. And last but most importantly is document it all. Okay, great. Thank you, David. Do we, do we have time for one more? Can I throw that one last one at you? Yes, absolutely. Let's do one more. <laughs> okay. And and this one is always inevitable, and I'm, I'm thinking that we should probably have a session just on liability. Um, you know, we always get one question or another on this, so it's a little granular, but I think we could take it up a level. But let me go ahead and read it as is. Michelle yeah. is asking, in, in the past, if flour contains a pathogen, it is considered adulterated. Now, if the supplier of flour receives a customer statement acknowledging the risk, does that shift the liability as well? Hmm. Well, I always have to throw a hard one at you. <laughs> no, that's that's an interesting question. And you know, I'd say, you know, my cop out is go talk to your general counsel and ask them. Um, mm -hmm. But 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 let me let me sort of speculate on that a little bit. Um, I think there is there is a nuance here that that is to do with do you know there's a pathogen in there, or are you just saying that this particular commodity has not been processed to control potential risks? So what I mean by that is, is you've tested flour, raw, ag raw agricultural commodity, and you have found salmonella in it, or E. coli 0157 in it, and you have shipped it. You have de facto shipped an adulterated product because you knew that it was that that, that that it was adulterated. That creates liability in my opinion. Again, I'm not I'm not an attorney, but that would be my view. If on the other hand you've shipped the same flour, you haven't tested it, um, but you know you haven't in, um, invoked a preventive control on it either, and as part of the, the requirements in FISMA, you're shipping it as a raw agricultural commodity in which there, you haven't applied a preventive control. And it's, you know, science would tell us that at some level there's going to be pathogens in it. And you are passing that on to your customer. Um, that's, that's a different animal. And the, the, the liability for controlling the risk in that product then shifts to the customer. Depending what the customer does with it, they may, if it's a business to business, they may be using it to, you know, create cookies or, or pastry or, you know, cakes or anything. Um, and obviously there is an expectation that it will go through an appropriate, uh, an appropriate kill step. Um, obviously if it's going all the way down to consumer level as raw flour, then it is sold as such. Um, but even then, as we obviously have seen recently, um, with raw flour, with with some uh, with some enterohemorrhagic E. coli in it um, was adulterated and triggered a recall. So that's my read on that, Jill. If, if I'm sort of hearing the question right, there is a bit of a nuance of knowingly shipping it with an with an adulterant in it versus it's just not been treated. So yes, the liabilities do shift um, a, a, a down the supply chain. I think is part of that. And, and with the caveat, of course, to um, consult with your general counsel. <laughs> yes, that. exactly. <laughs> right, right, right. This, that's that, right. that's 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 the non the non attorney David view of the world, which is probably uh, maybe at odds with what general counsel would say. So, great point. Go talk to your attorneys. Um, but we will take your insights. Any day, and, and David, I'm going to wrap up our session here. Thank you. Um, you know, when we first talked about shifting to this topic of guidance documents, I thought, oh, okay, well, will that be interesting? And I was proved wrong. That there was quite a bit that uh, was to be learned and gleaned in today's conversation. So thank you um, for that. You're very welcome. Absolutely. No, thank you, Jill, and thank you for the audience. Thank you for the great questions, as always. Yeah, no, absolutely. And as as always, um, session recording will be coming out. We usually do a blog post of sort of the the highlights. Um, you know, I encourage you to visit TAG site for the guidance documents and just to see their services as well as safety chain and helping compliance. Lots of um, learning ops will be hitting the road. Um, SQF conference is coming up. A couple other conferences coming up as well. 
So with that, um, October right now, we're slated to talk a little bit about the election year. That might be a hot topic, based on that. And then I've uh, moved environmental controls to November, but again, um, we will shift the dialogue based on what's relevant. So again, thank you, David. Good luck in uh, catching your next flight. And um, thank you for everyone for a, a lively conversation. Thank you, Jill. Okay, thank you all, bye-bye.